Checking San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology coming up in the next hour. News that Jeff Bezos is stepping down as CEO of Amazon reverberates through the tech industry. Why now? And what will his successor, Andy Jassy's deep cloud experience mean for Amazon's competitors? We've got insight. Plus, from insider to competitor, Scott Ruffin, Amazon's former delivery guru, has struck out on his own with a big logistics play, Pandion. We'll talk about how technology is transforming shipping and what it means for Amazon itself. And Tech Earnings continue highlights from my conversation with the outgoing and incoming CEOs of Qualcomm, Steve Mollenkopf and Cristiano Amon, as the chip industry is going through massive transformations. All those stories in a moment, but first, the S&P 500 paired gains at the close. It was a mixed bag for tech companies reporting results today. Bloomberg's Ed Ledlow has the latest. Ed, walk us through the day. Yeah, third straight day of gains broadly across U.S. equities, but it's almost like the market took a bit of a pause. You know, all of the momentum, frenzy, volatility around stocks like GameStop just holding off a little on Wednesday. You can see there the S&P 500 up, up marginally, a tenth of 1%, but that follows its biggest two-day decline in three months. And really, technology, one of the underperformers, if you think about it sector by sector, the NASDAQ 100, down by four-tenths of 1%. The NYSE Fan Plus Index, that big basket of mega-cap tech stocks, up by half a percent. But if you look at the next board, what you could see is some more explanation in that story. Some of the specific names driving moves in equity markets. Amazon down 2% following news that Jeff Bezos was stand down as CEO, Andy Jassy taking over. It had been in positive territory at some points throughout Wednesday, but ended lower as the market digests that move. A big point laggard on the Nasdaq 100. A similar story with Apple down by 8 tenths of 1%. Apple did report news that some users of various iCloud services may exp be experiencing difficulty in the latter part of the session. And then what a comparison. Microsoft, all-time high, up 1.5%. Alphabet, the parent company of Google, up more than 7% after it beat on earnings. A real recovery in the ad business from the holiday quarter, but also some optimism around its cloud business. The cloud business uh, actually recorded a loss for the first time as they broke out numbers for the cloud unit specifically. But they've invested really heavily there, and ben investors essentially giving uh, Google Cloud the benefit of the doubt that the investments they are making will pay dividends down the line and return in the form of margins. But a mixed bag for markets is that you of course, the market, Emily, is digesting news and progress as the Biden administration tries to pass a stimulus bill. Uh, meantime, Ed, Qualcomm shares have been slumping after hours. The company reporting results uh, and a forecast that disappointed some analysts. I spoke with uh, outgoing CEO Steve Mollenkopf and incoming CEO Cristiano Amon about their outlook ahead. They talked about uh, their bullishness on uh, Qualcomm burgeoning out into other industries, um, beyond handsets, for example. But, of course, handsets still the main part of that market um, where we have uh, seen so, some interesting changes. Take a listen to uh, this from Cristiano Amon about his outlook on handsets and 5G in the handset market. Take a listen. We have seen a V-shaped recovery of uh, the, of the handset market. The handset market is still contracted, and we're just – Call it, it's 7% uh, down, you know, but we're growing uh, within the market uh, because of 5G. And we saw that happen in developed markets and now emerging markets. Uh, there's definitely a recover on the handset. And, and uh, you know, the use cases are changing. It's like a lot of those uh, collaboration, uh, you know, activities we have, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's driving an upgrade towards high and premium tier devices. And uh, that's good for Qualcomm. Meantime, I had the two of them on the phone together, so just wanted to get a quick take on uh, the passing of the baton. Take a listen to uh, Steve Mollenkopf uh, talking about the opportunity ahead. Well, I tell you, I think the opportunity is great. Uh, you know, we, we know each other quite well, so I think, uh, but I would say move as fast as possible because it's uh, it's a great opportunity he has. Brought up on the I'm, I'm looking forward to cheering him on. Yeah, what I have to say, I think if Qualcomm's a good place to be, and we probably have one of the greatest opportunities ahead and, and the key thing is to is to keep executing on, on those opportunities. 
So, Ed, look, no question there, you know, is a shifting competitive landscape. Some, you know, shares had gone up uh, on the back of Apple's latest results. But, of course, you see more big tech companies like Apple moving chip making in-house. What's your read on the numbers? Yeah, I mean, it was a very marginal miss on revenue in the quarter gone. You know, expectation going into this was that Apple's blockbuster holiday quarter would kind of translate and read through to Qualcomm's results. But, you know, on the earnings call that's underway, uh, Molenkoff basically said that they had supply constraints which impacted their earnings in the quarter. They would have expected them to be better had it not be for those supply constraints. But the outlook for the current fiscal quarter ending in March is very positive. It suggests that there is consumer demand for 5G handsets. You have to go back to what Qualcomm does, right? It puts in the chips that help phones connect to the mobile network and it puts the smart in smartphone. And, you know, as 5G adoption drives as more 5G models come onto the market and the iPhone 12 proves to be a success. The expectation is that will translate through to Qualcomm's top line too. Well, of course, we'll be watching to see how Cristiano Amon takes over and leads, lead the leads the company, our Ed Ludlow. Thank you so much for that roundup. I, I do want to get it back, of course, to Amazon, its biggest management change in the company's history since Jeff Bezos founded the company in his garage more than 25 years ago. Bezos will step down as CEO of the world's largest online retailer later this year. He'll be succeeded by Andy Jassy, who currently runs AWS, the cloud juggernaut that has changed the way companies buy the technology that powers their businesses. Let's bring in Sucharita Kodali of Forrester Research to talk more about the future of the company. And Sucharita, the big question everyone keeps asking is, why now? Uh, of course, we expected this to happen someday, but it's certainly a lot sooner than people who follow the company really closely thought it would happen. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, it is. Um, it, I think it's, it's left a lot of people puzzling. But when we look to um, some other departures of other CEOs of tech companies, um, there are some commonalities. I mean, when we look to um, when Bill Gates left Microsoft or when Jack Ma left Alibaba. Those were situations where there was significant pressure due to, in the case of Microsoft, the antitrust issues. They were um, it was following a, a DOJ trial. In the case of Jack Ma, um, you know, just Chinese government, in retrospect, putting probably quite a bit of pressure on him to uh, to give up the reins. And that is um, likely to be something that is is worth considering here. I mean, certainly in in 2020, Amazon faced more scrutiny um, due to regulatory issues than probably ever in its history. And um, it is not outside the realm of possibility that um, the CEO would say, enough, I've had enough. I'd rather focus on things that are important to me and um, are, are game changing for the future of the world, whether it's space or, or other inventions. Now, he said, you know, he's moving into the role of executive chairman. He will be there, of course, as a resource. And I wonder how much he'll really be able to leave. Um, we, we saw Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer sort of struggle with the passing of the baton. Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce, took on a co-CEO. That didn't last very long. Um, you know, how do you think Bezos will handle that? And could potentially the confusion about who's in charge impact the company? Yeah, well, the one thing to keep in mind is that this um, new CEO is somebody who has worked with him for decades, and presumably they know each other quite well, and they know their working styles quite well. And, um, you know, that alone um, should, should hopefully ensure that the transition is relatively smooth. And, and even if it's not, um, that is one of the, 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 the questions that I think is important to keep open is that um, there doesn't seem to be any health issues. It's not um, an adversarial departure of Jeff Bezos. There is a chance that if things don't work out, he may come back and be CEO once again. Um, that's certainly what happened with Steve Jobs. So, so that is something that I think um, may also be in the minds of investors because um, this is not something that is um, such a shock and so outside of the realm of possibility. This is this is the succession plan that probably is the the smoothest succession plan that you could you could envision for Amazon. Uh, meantime, Amazon, you know, obviously Andy Jassy has been the architect of this cloud business, which has been wildly successful, how will Amazon going forward continue to balance the growth of its cloud 
and its retail business. And the fact that they're serving different stakeholders, whether it is, you know, businesses or individuals or, you know, the, the co-op editors, co-op editors, if you will. Yeah, yeah, the co-opetition and the, um, you know, kind of the, the concerns of, of becoming a competitor with the clients that you serve, which has been um, a huge issue, not just in AWS, but certainly also in its delivery business and its third-party seller business. Um, this is absolutely um, probably one of the biggest challenges that the company now faces with its existing businesses. But a common theme that has emerged with um, people who have, you know, in, in the last few days come out and, and spoken um, about their experiences with Andy Jassy or understanding um, his management style, he's very much an inventor. Um, and uh, the company very much has a culture of invention. And um, if there is a sense that um, the company has gone as far as it can in existing businesses, this is a company that will not um, shy away from pivoting. Um, they've already pivoted many, many times and invented new businesses that, that didn't exist before, whether it is the Kindle device or the Echo device or cloud services. Um, they've, in many cases, borrowed ideas from other companies where there has been success, like their advertising business or their delivery business. So the future of the company, which is very much rooted in its history where there is already been tremendous success, is to continue to look to build new products and build new services. So, Charita, thank you so much for that incredibly eloquent uh, assessment of what's going on here. Sucharita Kodali of Forrester Research, uh, appreciate you stopping by. Okay, coming up, the increasing dependence on the cloud. I'm talking with the CEO of Dynatrace, John Van Seeklin, on the company's big earnings beat and what it means for some of his partners like Amazon going forward. That is next, this is Bloomberg. What was once a nicety has become a necessity. Cloud computing has been embraced by government, schools, businesses, and kept them all up and running through the pandemic. But now they don't want to rely on just one cloud, but many. Dynatrace, a cloud monitoring platform, uh, makes a multi-cloud operation possible. They're out with results that topped estimates and sent their stock soaring for the second day in a row. I'm joined now by the CEO of Dynatrace, John Van Sleeklin. John, thank you so much for joining us. I got to start on this Amazon news because you have a partnership with not just Amazon, but also Google and Microsoft. What's your take on Andy Jassy um, becoming the, the heir apparent to Amazon and uh, the person who's going to have to presumably fill some big shoes over AWS? Well, he's obviously done a fantastic job with, uh, with AWS, you know, sort of envisioning it, scaling it, and growing it into just a phenomenal, you know, it's a phenomenon. And um, obviously, has you know caused Microsoft to react, Google to react, and you know he's he's quite a businessman. So I think Amazon's probably in good hands. Um, does this make uh, Amazon a, 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 an even more you know um, a competitor that inspires even more fear in the likes of Google and Microsoft, or is this like a you know does this potentially give them a competitive advantage? You know, it's a good question. You have to see how that plays out, whether AWS gets a little more favors or whether uh, Andy gets pulled in some additional directions and, you know, uh, and, and maybe, maybe it gives Microsoft and Google an opportunity. But, but from our point of view, it's um, the, the cloud phenomena is, is, has been phenomenally powerful uh, for all businesses around the world. It underpins digital transformation everywhere. In fact, it enables it. Uh, and we're a beneficiary of that acceleration in digital transformation. Uh, and the fact that, you know, the more, the more companies go to a multi-cloud approach, uh, the more complex it is, the more need for a heterogeneous kind of monitoring or, or observability platform uh, like Dynatrace. And so uh, we think it's all good. 
does this multi-cloud phenomenon, I mean, you know, 10 years ago it was, do we need a cloud at all? And now here, here we are, we need, we need multiple clouds. How does that impact um, the evolution of a company like yours and the cloud technology sector? Well, so one of the important things to understand about Dynatrace is that we focus on, you know, only the largest companies on the planet. So we, we sort of draw a line at about a billion dollar kind of company and larger because they have more complex challenges, especially when, you know, it comes to digital transformation. And so they're the ones that we see move into multi-clouds first. None of them want to be locked into just one. They want to sort of play the field a little bit. Um, and there's a portability kind of technology now, container technology, you know, called Kubernetes that allows for the portability of applications and workloads among the various clouds, as well as private, you know, extensions of these clouds. Uh, so with that kind of portability layer, this move to multi-cloud has accelerated. Uh, and, you know, as I said, it just accelerates the complexity, you know, needs. Uh, or, or uh, requirements and challenges for these enterprises. And, and our business is to light up the, the clouds and the application environments, help the companies understand how they're operating, how they work, uh, predict challenges or, or bottlenecks so they can be resolved before they impact users or, or different services that they might offer and um, allow them to take action you know, immediately as opposed to dig around, hunt around, maybe take days or weeks the way it has in, in, in past lives. Uh, and we do, uh, we do this all for some of the very largest, you know, cloud environments. And some of them might be surprising right. actually. Who some now, of these are. You know, uh, we talk a lot about, we talk a lot about Amazon's dominance from a retail perspective, but I think it's less understood how dominant AWS is. And you know, given the possibility of more regulatory scrutiny facing Amazon, does it feel like like Amazon has an, has an, has a too dominant share of of the cloud ecosystem as an operator within it? I wouldn't say so much on the cloud side because of you know Microsoft and Google's presence. You know, maybe on the retail side, uh, the e-commerce side, it's a little more painful. Um, but uh, you know, we see. Uh, we see, you know, quite a strong, you know, that Microsoft and Google are strong competitors. Uh, they have plenty of money to invest. They are investing. They all have sort of their angle on the market. And like I said, the market wants multiple clouds. Nobody wants to be locked into only one. So, you know, that sort of provides, a, you know, a little bit of uh, a relief and cover for, for Amazon from a regulatory standpoint, at least on the AWS side. Interesting. Well, we'll be watching to see if this ends up being some sort of competitive advantage for Google and Microsoft. Really interesting to hear your, your cloud insider's perspective on all of the dynamics there. John Van Sieklin, CEO of Dynatrace. Okay, coming up, where exactly do things stand with the mass vaccination, the biggest vaccination campaign in history? We will have the very latest on the ground next. This is Bloomberg. California and New York governors say they will be opening stadiums now as mass COVID-19 vaccination sites. New York City will also expand vaccine eligibility to restaurant workers, taxi drivers, and people who live and work in homes for the developmentally disabled. Meantime, San Francisco is now suing its own school district over its failure to reopen schools. AstraZeneca and the University of Oxford are planning to have a re-engineered shot that protects against new mutations. The drug could be available by the fall. Joining us now for more, Bloomberg's healthcare reporter, Riley Griffin. Riley, I want to start, though, on J&J, &J, Johnson & Johnson, which had some really promising data out last week. They've now submitted for emergency youth authorization for a one-shot shot. How dramatically could that change the way this story plays out? Yeah, it's a great question. And we are at a pivotal moment in the U.S. mass vaccination campaign. More Americans have now received at least one dose than have actually tested positive for the virus since the pandemic began. That means 33.7 million doses have been given, according to our state-by-state -state tally. 
And in the last week, an average of 1.32 million doses per day were administered. But we want to push those numbers up. And one thing that's going to be critical is getting additional supply on hand. Those 33.7 million doses are attributable to two vaccines, one from Moderna, one from Pfizer. And J&J is now poised to be a third entrant. They are submitting this very week for emergency use authorization. And that process actually takes place over a series of weeks. We're going to see U.S. regulators evaluate the data, um, convene a panel of independent advisors to review it and make their own recommendation. And we expect to see an emergency use, use authorization come March. At that point, we will see new doses flood the market. But we actually heard from officials earlier this week that it may not immediately ease the widespread supply constraints you're noting that have been slowing the U.S. immunization campaign. Um, it will, however, a difficult to reach populations that need protection from the virus, like those in rural communities or those confined at home, given that ease of the single shot and the fact that J&J's vaccine can be kept at refrigerator temperatures. So what about these efforts from Johnson & Johnson to Pfizer to help combat these variants? How successful uh, do these efforts seem so far um, and will they work? Yeah, we are really in early stages. All we know right now is that Pfizer, J&J, Moderna, AstraZeneca, each one of these companies is probing new ways to battle a disease that is constantly changing and could remain active for years to come. Um, the South African variant, like with the UK mutation, knows no bounds or borders. They've reached the U.S. And, and something we learned out of that J&J data last week is that the shot was found to be 72% effective in the U.S but that actually fell to 57% in South Africa. Another vaccine developed by Novavax was 89% effective in the UK, but only 49% effective in South Africa. And those no numbers are sobering. To be sure, lab tests looking at the number of antibodies induced by the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, they've also suggested that they may be less potent against the South African variant though still providing a semblance of protection. From what we understand, wow. booster shots or new strain-specific vaccines are within reach. They could also translate, of course, okay. into a sustained revenue stream for drug makers. Riley, those, those numbers are astounding. Thank you so much for the specificity there and for your great reporting on this. We'll uh, continue to follow your work. Riley Griffin, who covers healthcare for us, thank you. And coming up, more on the big Amazon bombshell. Jeff Bezos stepping down, Andy Jassy taking his place. We'll, call, we'll talk to a former Amazon insider next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Back to our top story of the day. Jeff Bezos stepping back. Andy Jassy taking his place as CEO in the third quarter of this year. Long before the pandemic overloaded U.S. delivery infrastructure, uh, a former Amazon employee, Scott Ruffin, was trying to make it a shipping powerhouse. He founded and led Amazon Air, the company's air cargo and transportation offering, and now he wants to solve shipping problems on his own. His new startup, Pandion, has gotten $5 million in funding and aims to offer major retailers affordable, fast deliveries while competing with his former employer, Amazon itself. Scott joins us now to discuss. Now, Scott, uh, you know, have to ask what your perspective is on this as someone who worked at Amazon for so many years. Um, Jeff Bezos stepping down much sooner than, than most of us thought he would. Um, and naming Andy Jassy as his replacement. When you heard this news, what was your reaction? Oh, well, I don't, wouldn't say I was entirely surprised. Um, Jeff has been talking for a while now publicly about you know, some of his best work being some of the things he's doing outside of Amazon, Blue Origin, for an example. Um, but I will say that I mean, the specific timing of it, I'm not sure if there's any time that's good for uh, um, a founder with the success that he's had to move on from uh, um, um, his position as CEO. Uh, I would say, however, that uh, uh, I do think that Amazon's in just fantastic hands with uh, Andy and, and Dave Clark, who's the CEO of Worldwide Consumer, uh, being able to you know, take the reins from here on out. Um, uh, I think they're going to be in, um, in pretty good shape for sure. 
Well, as somebody who worked with Jeff Bezos for so many years, do you really think he's going to be able to hand over the reins? That easily? Well, I'm really not so sure. I mean, um, um, you know, I don't know if I have a whole lot of perspective about, you know, you know, his, de his desire to do that. But I think there is some pretty good precedent of that. You know, Bill Gates did, you know, had a similar move, at, you know, as he was exiting Microsoft. And, you know, Eric Schmidt did as well, if I recall. So um, uh, given the, the level of uh, uh, competency that he has around him with Andy and, and Dave and the rest of the S team, um, uh, I, uh, um, I think he's going to be able to you know, you know, back out a little bit, sure. So uh, let's talk about a, a bit about uh, the delivery operation, which, you know, you helped for so many years. Amazon reduce its reliance on, on FedEx and, and UPS, uh, but you still think that there are some gaps in the process. Um, where are those gaps? Yeah, I think most uh, uh, most entirely most of those gaps are outside of Amazon. The other sixty percent of the the market that's uh, trying to compete with Amazon, at least here in the U.S. Um, and so, what we're building is an opportunity, a, a, a business that's going to focus on the middle mile. That's going to build a a purpose built network for e commerce deliveries. Um, using machine learning, our uh, intelligence and data uh, in order to make sure that we can optimize that package flow from end to end and give the, all the other retailers uh, that are out there the uh, same type of uh, on-time delivery and, and delivery experience to their consumers that, that, that Amazon enjoys. So the pandemic has really strained the logistics industry. When we all go back to work, when we're all vaccinated, what makes you think demand is going to keep up? Well, um, I mean, just yesterday, for instance, is one data point. Um, Carol Tomey uh, in UPS's earnings call uh, mentioned that uh, it, in the peak season of uh, last year, in 2020, there was about a 3 million package shortfall of supply versus demand. She also mentioned in that same call that uh, she doesn't expect that to change um, in 2021. Um, the pandemic has trained a, you know, tens of millions of Americans um, to, bu to, to buy online, uh, baby boomers in particular, um, who may not have been uh, online shoppers or um, uh, shopping online today and are enjoying the convenience of e-commerce. Uh, there have been some articles in, uh, um, uh, in recent publications talking about how, you know, surveys uh, indicate that it's, it's not going to change. Um, so my thesis is that uh, while there will be some return back to brick and mortar, um, it's still going to be significant growth on top of the, this Uber growth we saw in 2020. So it sounds like you're saying you don't intend to compete with Amazon. Do you ever intend to compete with Amazon, even if not yeah, today? So um, our primary competitors will be um, uh, those, uh, um, uh, those transportation providers that all of Amazon's competitors use. Amazon's so um, the FedExes, the UPSs uh, uh, of the world. Um, and that would be our primary uh, uh, a competition in the days ahead. Um, a lot of people like to speculate about Amazon's interests in getting into that space. You know, they may, they may not, but, but just like Amazon's really focused on their, um, uh, on their customers as opposed to the competition, we're taking much of the same, you know, approach and really focusing on meeting the needs that, you know, e-commerce retailers have now to improve the experience for them and their customers, and we'll let the competition take care of itself. All right. Uh, fascinating. We'll be we'll be keeping our eye on you. Uh, Pandion founder and CEO Scott Ruffin, uh, former longtime Amazon employee. Thanks so much. Now back to the as we've been discussing biggest corporate shift so far this year. Amazon CEO and founder Jeff Bezos stepping away from his post to become executive chair, leaving that role to be filled by AWS CEO Andy Jassy. For more reaction, I want to bring in Roman Stanek, CEO of the software company. Good data. Roman, you've actually been critical of, of Amazon's ability to handle so-called co-opetition, um, which refers to their ability um, to uh, work with a, a number of different kinds of stakeholders, whether it's individuals or companies or other partners. Um, what do you make of this uh, passing of the baton from um, the, Jeff Bezos to Andy Jassy, who's been running the cloud business now? For years, yeah. Uh, good afternoon. I actually believe that uh, Andy Jassy actually did amazing job at uh, 
kind of balancing the uh, the competition, it's almost impossible building uh, uh, a platform, a cloud platform of that size without uh, engaging in, in co uh, competition with your existing clients or future clients. So he actually did an amazing job and he, he balanced it really well and he competes with good data, even though we are competitors and he competes with uh, uh, many, many of his existing clients. And he sort of uh, check history, check history with uh, uh, with open source, and I think that that's kind of his biggest strength is how do you bring innovation in the market? How do you take away from the market and still give it, give back enough so that people actually don't consider you 100% competitor and go someplace else? And that's going to be critical for the success of Amazon in the future. So, you now believe this is the biggest challenge ahead. How do they balance uh, their retail and their cloud? business and 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 how how do they do that um given that they're both incredibly powerful and, and both incredibly promising yeah it's if it, you know from my perspective the biggest competitor of, of amazon is not any individual brand it's actually technology company uh like uh, like shopify because shopify can actually do the same what amazon did in the past and that is kind of combined services combined uh uh, uh, systems and strengths of, of individual brands. So the competitor is not any any individual brand. The competitor is a connection by a common service like Shopify. And uh, so it's going to be it's going to be essentially it's going to be Amazon plus AWS uh, against everyone else uh, plus Shopify. It's interesting you mentioned Shopify. I interviewed a CEO. Toby Lutka last year, and he said, if Amazon is building an empire, then we are arming the rebels. How big of a threat is a company like Shopify and um, you know the relationships that they are building with merchants who could sell their wares on Amazon, but thanks to Shopify can sell them directly to their customers? Yeah, absolutely. That's my. That's exactly my point. I believe that uh, Shopify is the biggest, biggest competitor to Amazon, and that's why Andy Jesse got his job because he knows how to actually balance this, you know, this competition. And, you know, uh, Shopify can do next year, they can do like Shopify Prime and any brand and you will not in people, shipping and so on. It's, it's I said the future of uh, this distributed fluid e-commerce where on one hand you will have a, a collection of services and on the other hand, you will have our collection of services under the, the, the Shopify brand. And Shopify is like a general modus of commerce. You know, it's not an individual brand. It's all the brands together. Um, well, interesting take there. Roman Stanek, CEO of Good Data. Roman, I appreciate you uh, helping us think of, um, you know, new tentacles for this story. Thank you so much for stopping by. Okay, coming up. The building blocks of artificial intelligence and data aggregation. We're going to speak to the CEO of the AI platform, Databricks, about their big funding round and why some are comparing the company to the next snowflake. That is next. This is Bloomberg. The power is in your data. Cloud companies are expanding faster than ever with the ever evolving dependence on technology. Companies like Databricks, a data management platform, also seeing major growth. The company just secured a billion dollars in funding from Amazon, Alphabet, and others, putting the value of the private company at $28 billion. Databricks CEO, Ali Godzi with me now. Ali, talk to us a little bit about how the company works and what the biggest revenue driver is to get to this $28 billion valuation. Yeah, absolutely. So we help companies take massive amounts of data they have in the cloud into artificial intelligence, data science, and machine learning on it. But the way it works is companies already have vast amounts of data on these what's called data lakes that the cloud providers uh, provide. Uh, but today to get value out of it, they have to copy it to other places. They have to copy it into data warehouses and other systems We've cracked the code on how to combine these data warehouses with the data lakes in what we call the lake houses, 
directly so that they don't need to copy the data out. They can directly start doing machine learning, data science, and make their organizations much more efficient. So at $28 billion, I mean, shouldn't you be a, a public company? Why stay private at all? And, and what's your plan to get to the public markets? Yeah, I mean, the way right now the private markets work is that there's a lot of access to capital. Uh, you can also get the same investors that you can actually get in public markets, as we showed in this round. We brought in all the big mutual funds. Um, you can actually provide liquidity to your employees, and you know you can get quite a bit of press. So you know the urgency that used to be that you have to go public to you know get access to capital markets. You don't quite need that. So we're taking our time. There's quite a few things that I actually think that you want to do that are strategic that you cannot do when you're public. So we're doing those now. Um, you know, some folks out there are saying you're the next snowflakes, and I'm sure that you are looking at the options, whether it's a SPAC or could it be a direct listing, given that you just raised this funding and, and maybe don't need any more? Well, we're looking at all the different options. There are pros and cons to these. Uh, you know, direct listing, of course, is less dilution. Uh, but then on the other hand, with the IPO, you can build a much deeper relationship. Uh, with the mutual funds that invest in you, but you're doing that at a discount, right? You're discounting it and it dilutes the company more. So we're looking at the different options. I mean, we're seeing the different companies actually utilize them and we're learning from them. So curious, given that Amazon um, is one of your backers, what your take is on, on the passing of the baton from Jeff Bezos to Andy Jassy, especially given that Andy Jassy is, is, is so big in, in your world, which is the cloud. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan. Uh, Andy's amazing. Uh, he actually had something to do with the investment in this particular round of Databricks. Um, and I think it's great for us all around. And I think it's good for uh, Amazon as well uh, to have him at the helm. Um, and I also think, you know, there are lots of other people that, that will be taking over at AWS. We look forward to working with them. So I think this is good. And it shows how important these cloud services are and how important they're going to be. And it's a testament to how important data and AI also will be uh, going forward. We spoke to a former longtime Amazon employee yesterday who said she felt sorry for whoever it was that was going to fill Andy Jassy's shoes leading AWS. And I'm curious if you think him um, shifting his focus to not just AWS, but the entire company opens up a competitive, competitive advantage potentially for Microsoft and Alphabet, which I know is, is another one of your backers. Well, I think there's going to be a place for all these different uh, cloud companies. I don't think any of them is going to go away. Uh, and they have different strengths and weaknesses. Uh, Amazon is going to continue to double down on its strengths. You know, it's really developer focused. You know, um, you know, Microsoft has the enter enterprise relationships, the enterprise agreements, uh, and you know, Google with the AI. So, you know, I think there's a place for each of them. Um, I don't think that's going to change. So, uh, where do you see the the evolution of cloud and AI? I mean. A decade ago, when we started Bloomberg Technology, the cloud was just this nascent thing. Now everyone, but he wants multiple clouds. Where will we be in another decade? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually think that there's a secular trend that's going on that people maybe don't think about, which is that multi-cloud is going to become more and more a thing. I hear it from enterprises all the time. They're saying, you know, we actually need to make sure that we're not putting all our eggs in one basket. So how can we make sure that we're multi-cloud? So companies like Databricks then ensure that, you know, you don't have to pick one cloud. You can pick vendors that work across them and you can then partner with all of them. That's one thing. But I also think AI is a thing that you're going to see much, much more of. So now we talk about cloud computing. In 10 years, it's all just going to be about AI, machine learning, data science. So how does that impact your Databricks' priorities? Yeah, I mean, our focus is to democratize and simplify AI further. Right now, it's not super simple for enterprises to get the value of AI. Our mission is make it simpler and simpler so every enterprise can get value of it. If you think of a company like Google, they wouldn't even be here today if it wasn't for data and AI. Well, that's not quite true about all the other enterprises out there, but in 10 years, that will be the case. They either will have AI, just like Google had, or they're going to be put out of business and some other forward tech company in Silicon Valley or somewhere else will replace them. All right, uh, the CEO of Databricks, Ali Godzi, uh, interesting uh, picture and future you paint for us. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, coming up with no clear timeline for Ant Group's public market debut, investors are piling into another record IPO for Hong Kong's exchange, short form video app, Kwai Show. We're gonna bring you the very latest with a live report from Hong Kong next. This is Bloomberg.
China's number two short video app is proving the latest hit for Hong Kong investors. Kwai Show is selling heavily ahead of its public debut on Friday, underscoring the high level of demand for the world's biggest internet IPO in two years. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg's Chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel. Stephen, what should we be watching for when it comes to Kwai Show? Yeah, Kwai Show. It's an interesting company because it's uh, one of the biggest success stories in the internet for China in the past decade, and there's been quite a few of those. And you know, the the company uh, Kwai Show means fast hands, and and literally, it's been a fast turnaround for this company uh, that uh, rose from really nothing uh, and riding the wave uh, that TikTok really started with those, uh, you know little apps, uh, video apps, as well as uh, virtual gifts. That's their number one revenue stream right now, is the live platform, live streaming, uh, virtual gifts. Uh, and they've built this into a big IPO tomorrow that's going to list here in Hong Kong, 5.4 billion U.S. dollars. Uh, Su Hua is the chairman and founder. He started off uh, as a Google employee in Beijing and has turned this thing into quite a phenomenon. And uh, it's interesting. It's a Tencent-backed company, yes. And just yesterday, there was even, a, or two days ago, in a Beijing court, we saw ByteDance, which is their big rival, of course, in the, the video, live short clip videos, uh, actually suing Tencent because they're equivalent to TikTok domestically, Douyin, uh, they alleged uh, was uh, in violation of uh, antitrust laws. Tencent was in violation of antitrust laws for not having Douyin on QQ and um, you know, WeChat in China. So there's a big competition going on in this space. And right now, Hong Kong institutional and retail investors are plowing into this uh, new IPO tomorrow, you know, Kwai Show, in large part as well because of the Ant IPO collapse. There's a lot of liquidity out there, and they're looking at Kwai Show. Right. Let's talk about the IPO that didn't happen, which is Ant. Ant has now come to an agreement with Chinese regulators. Where does that stand and what does it mean for Jack Ma, who's been under a lot of pressure and even sort of disappeared for a few weeks? Yeah, he's kind of persona non grata right now, taking a very low profile, obviously. I mean, just in state media a couple of days ago, they did this big, long list of the you know, the most influential tech luminaries in China. And a pony ma of Tencent was on that list. Uh, also, of course, uh, Lei Jun of Xiaomi, Ren Zhengfei of Huawei was on that list. But Jack Ma, probably the kingpin of them all, was not on that list. So that kind of tells you that he is out of favor right now. But the good thing, I guess you could say about Ant, is they're not going to be totally broken up. They're going to be folded into their, all their assets, by the way, folded into a holding company that will be overseen by the People's Bank of China. They want to contain the risks because the number one revenue stream for Ant now is no longer payments. It's micro lending. And that is a big concern. They need to raise their capital. Uh, it's going to be probably value the company much less. Some say about half what it was going to be if they win IPO uh, in Hong Kong late last year. Uh, but, you know, they're just restructuring and we'll have to see. But it was a uh, sigh of relief for some investors that it's not going to be entirely broken up and they will be able to continue with uh, many of their businesses beyond just payments, but just in a more restrictive manner. So will an IPO for Ant ever happen? Could it absolutely? I mean, we heard uh, from the the PBOC governor Yi Gong, uh, what a week or so ago, a week and a half or so ago, uh, you know, was not ruling it out. It's it's just a matter of how, uh, you know. Jack Ma and Alibaba slash Ant are going to comply with the new regulatory environment. Keep in mind, these new restrictions that are coming in uh, down the pike from authorities in China, the anti-monopoly, new draft laws, they're all new, and it's new for Ant as well. So they're going to have to comply. Once they comply, and if, if they do comply, uh, they perhaps could go IPO again, but it's not going to be as large as it was. Ren just last quick question, Steve. We've got about a minute left. But is there concern at Alibaba proper where, you know, I know Jack Ma is no longer there about how this all reflects on the company and could it lead to stiffer regulatory action on Alibaba itself? Yeah, that's a, a big concern because they've had a, you know, a, a spree of acquisitions as well. And they've already been slapped on the wrist for some of those acquisitions and not being so forthcoming. I mean, I've interviewed Jack Ma several times over the last, 
what, 18 years I've been at Bloomberg, and he's always repeated a similar mantra, and that is he has to stay ahead of regulators. Uh, well, that's coming back to bite him right now. And some have even argued maybe an Alibaba with Daniel Zhang as CEO uh, is better off with Jack Ma maybe on the sidelines. I, I'm not saying that. I've heard that, though, because he's drawing a lot of attention to himself right now. And obviously, uh, what his comments at the Shanghai Bund Conference uh, in, what, December or, or November uh, did not uh, win him any favors with regulators who are now catching up right. with the behemoth right. that is Alibaba. It's certainly been fascinating to watch it play out. Uh, Bloomberg Stephen Engel uh, in Hong Kong. Of course, you know the story better than almost anyone else. So thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We've got Bloomberg Daybreak Asia coming up next. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.